Welcome, everyone, to the PCS Like a Pro Show. I'm your host, Megan Harless, as always, and we've got a really great show lined up for you today. Um, we're going to be talking with Chris here about what it is we want our community to know, uh, want the industry to know about it, and everything in regards to PCSing. Before we get into all of that, I just want to remind everybody that if you've got a summer PCS coming up, you will not be getting your mover assigned until next month. Look. We're looking at mid to late April is when Transcom is saying those should start getting um, assigned out to your TSPs and you'll start seeing those emails come in and you'll start getting all that contact info from your TSP. So if you're sitting there waiting, wondering, you know, we had this booked a month ago, why am I not hearing anything? Everybody is in the same boat. Next month is when it's projected to start. So we got Chris joining us today. So I'm going to tell everybody really quick, if you're watching, hit that share button. Um, if you're in the moving industry, you're going to want to hit that share button because you're going to want everybody in your network to know what we're talking about today. If you are my military community, you want to hit that share button and let your friends know about this going on and join us. Um, today, is, we're going to do it in a little bit of a reverse format where Chris is going to be our host today asking us all these different questions that the moving industry wants to know. And it's our turn to be able to share with them everything that they should know as to why we do the things the way that we do. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense, but hopefully today we can help share a little bit of light on all of that. Um, so Chris, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Megan, thanks for having me on. I'm actually a little disappointed um, that I couldn't do the intro since I'm the host of this show and you're on the panel. So uh, but I'll give it to you there. Um, I'm excited for being on the show and. Looking forward to talking and educating both industry and, um, you know, future future customers that are going to plan their move this summer. And like you had mentioned real quick, I think last week's call that you were on, there's about 10,000 shipments that may be backlogged by the time they start um, introducing them into the network, uh, like you had said, mid-April. So that's, that's about three times more the norm than the initial dump in, uh, you know, the second week or first week of March. So... That's going to be interesting to watch and see how that unfolds. Um, but let's roll into the show. You ready? All right. Um, yes, let's absolutely. Let's get started. All right. Um, how far in advance do you receive your orders, um, like we just talked about, in, for them to process for the summertime? A couple months, a couple weeks? Um, so this is all really going on service. I know the Army is working really hard to get um, – orders cut 120 days in advance to be able to give families that time to prep and prepare and get their move established. However, the Army recently transitioned over to a new system. And so with that transition, we're starting to see a backlog of orders being issued and a lot of them not being issued until about three weeks until their report date um, that we've seen this spring. Hopefully by the time we start hitting the summertime, that starts getting a little bit better. But typically we can get them anywhere from six months in advance to three months in advance. And we've even had times where surprise orders do happen and it's 30 days or two weeks in advance of when it is you need to be either leaving or reporting yeah absolutely like sarah said in the chat that is that seems extremely stressful especially the less time that you have to do that um and when you do you before your orders are cut as they say right um do you have any idea of where you're moving or where you're going to or is that a complete secret to here's the package this is where you're moving and you went open it up like christmas like uh, oh jesus or oh yeah hawaii great like how does that go um so we do get a little bit of say sometimes as to what is happening of where we go um we call it the dream sheet or the wish list um and everything we get a list of all the possible open assignments for things and we get it to rank them as to where we want to go, where we don't want to go. Sometimes in that ranking, we have um, some rules that we have to follow with how we rank things. Sometimes we have to put, um, if we haven't been overseas in so long, um, we have to put one of those in our top 10 or so. Um, depending on the number of Korea slots, because there's always a ton of Korea slots, um, you may have to put one of those listed in your top five. But we get a list and we get to kind of preference them. Uh, they do try to give service members um if they are within the top five they call it a success um 
type of thing, but it's not uncommon to go needs of the military. We've had that happen a couple of times where we ended up someplace not completely on our radar. Um, so we may be researching other locations, trying to figure out you know, where we wanna live, what schools, um, all of that stuff up front. And then by the time we get our orders, we're able to like pull the trigger of like, yes, we're going here, You know, go lock in this house. Or we get those surprise orders to a place we didn't know was a possibility. And then we have to start that research process all over. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Um, just so now that you talked about that, what does everyone want? Why does everyone want to move between Memorial Day and middle of July is what we call peak season when everybody else is moving in the moving industry. COD is at a high, national account, corporate at a high. It's like it's a hot topic. Um, and do you guys get to pick those dates or is it come kind of come with that surprise sheet of, hey, here's where you're moving and this is when you're moving as well? Um, so we typically know if we're on summer cycle, uh, we know generally it's going to be somewhere between that Memorial Day and maybe Labor Day time period. A lot of that will also depend on exactly what our report date is. Um, sometimes we can give a little um, input as to our report date. Sometimes if our, we have good communication with the office that cuts our orders, we can be able to say, hey, school ends on this date, so we want to report after it. We don't want to have to pull our kids early kind of deal. Um, other times we don't really get a say and it just comes down to whatever the needs are. It could be dependent upon a unit coming back from a rotation or a deployment. It could be based off of somebody needing to leave that assignment to go to a schoolhouse um, that they're required to go to. It could be based off a change of command. Um, so there's a lot of factors that can go into determining what a report date is, when that happens, and ultimately when we end up having to report because they always try to have the incoming person report before the outgoing person so we have some handoff time it doesn't always happen but i will say for our family i enjoy a summer move um we have the ability our kids finish out the school year we can go we can get set up we take a little time to do a vacation we get to explore our new area before school starts so we learn some of the cool places and the hidden gems um we get to feel like we're a little bit a part of that community before school starts whereas i feel like if we're moving during the school year they're going to dive right into school and all of that stuff and maybe we don't get to know our area as intimately as we might be able to because we don't have that time to explore and to learn the ins and outs of what's around us. And, and that's all that that's awesome feedback, Max. And do they move families that have well, I guess that no one really knows in the industry. Do they move families and say, hey, here's your orders. Sorry that you have to pull your kid from school. He's in the middle of second grade. You know, so you're going to San Diego now out of Norfolk. Does that happen? It does. It does. There's a lot of people that um, do know they're going to end up moving during the school year. Um, again, needs of the military surprise orders do happen. Um, you may be expecting to PCS maybe between school semesters and they may have to bump you up because something else happens or they may push you later into like the spring semester. Now you're still moving during the school year. Um, some people enjoy moving during the school year. Some people do not. So that's kind of a personal preference. But um, yeah, a lot of times, I mean, we see kids that get pulled from schools and end up at the next school. We get a lot of questions that happen in the groups of, you know, for this state, does anybody know how long do they have to be in school for it to be considered a completed grade? You know, we're moving maybe in April, school ends in May. Can I just not enroll them and it still be okay? Or do I need to enroll them for the last two weeks? Um, you know, there's a lot of those conversations that happen, but there is uh, frequently many families that do move during the school year and have to pull their kids and then reestablish at a new location. Wow, that's crazy. So I, I could possibly be 20 years old, a senior in high school, technically, sometimes. Yeah, so there are there are ways. Uh, so we call it high school stabilization. So if you have, um, I believe it's if they are in their junior year, you can request high school stabilization where they can let you stay at your location for your high school student to be able to graduate high school there. Right. Um, they do understand, you know, the importance of that, especially, you know, going into possibly college, um, you know, playing sports, um, all of that. A lot of school districts have very strict rules about their uh, valedictorian and their salutatorian that they have to attend so many years in the school district to be able to meet that. So we see a lot of times that kids get pulled and have to move and they might have had the highest GPA at their one school, but they won't be eligible to be valedictorian because they didn't attend for four years. Um, so 
The military does try to take that into consideration if you apply for high school stabilization to be able to let your um, high schoolers graduate there. Sometimes it's approved, sometimes it's not. And that's where we start seeing families make the decision that they're going to send their service member on to the next location. And they'll be what we call a geo bachelor, geographical bachelor, um, and they'll be at their next location doing their job while the family and the kids stay behind to let the kids either finish the school year or finish their high school career, um, whatever it may be. Sometimes in the summer, we see families want to move ahead of the service members report date because they want to get to location and start the school year at that new location. They might have orders for September, October, school starts, end of August. They're trying to move in August. That way they can get their kids set up and not have to have them start mid-semester as well. Wow, that makes sense. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, before, after our orders are cut, we do something. There's, what kind of counseling is done before your move takes place? And I'm going to get a little bit in depth with that question because it seems like there's still a lot of uncertainty or, or uneducated there's a lot of uneducated service members and or moving companies too, but in reference to the high value inventories, what goes on there, what moves, so forth and so on. Can you fill us in a little bit on the pre-counseling and if high value inventories, no pack lists and stuff like that are included on that? I know it's done electronically now to where it used to be in person and you sat and talked to someone and now is it like we all do click, 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 move, click, 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 move. Like tell me a little bit about that process. Yes. Yeah, so again, every service does things differently and some of them are better at it than others. So for the army, it's all online. It's all through DPS. So it's, you click, you fill in some, some uh, boxes, you click the next button and it gives you some information to read through. You click the next button, you fill in some more stuff. It gives you some more information to read. Um, other services, they still have in-person counselings um, to some degree where you can go in and you can talk with somebody and sit down with people. If it's your first PCS or if it's your retirement or separation PCS, you are required to go to the transportation office to set those moves up because um, Obviously, your first PCS, you don't know anything, so they sit down to make sure you know what you need to know for it. If it's your last PCS, the process is a little bit different in return in, a, in terms to our entitlements that we receive. So on a separation, like we don't get our, our um, lodging entitlements and our dislocation allowance and things like that. So they sit you down to go through all of that to make sure you understand exactly what you should and should not be receiving. Um, but otherwise, it's all done online. Some... Um, services have classes you can take. Um, they offer like a little brief class to go over things. Uh, again, some are better than others, depending on where you're at and depending on the service. Some go over everything from the process of PCSing to your entitlement. Some just go over the physical movement of your household goods. Um, you know, so it's all done a little bit differently and it's not all created equal. And that's where we see a big education gap amongst our, our families as to what they do know and don't know. Um, and you'll see that varies a lot also depending on the location that they're at and also what service they're a part of. Um, in terms to the high value inventory, uh, we get told there's a high value inventory. We get told we get to put whatever we want on it. If it's valuable to us, we can put it on there. Um, we've seen uh, times where we've had moving companies that have said like only things that cost $2,000 or $5,000 are allowed on the high value inventory. And we get a lot of questions in the in the groups of, well, I thought I could put anything on there. Or I thought I could list this. They're telling me this. And we always go back to the regulations. What do the regulations state? And so I've got the regulations posted in my group and I go in there and I screenshot it or I tag them and say, hey, this page, this is what it says about high value inventory. It says $100 per pound, hard to replace, irreplaceable, collection, china, crystal, all of that stuff. Um, you know, so they at least have a general guideline of what they can put on there. And then they've got something they can show their moving crews of, hey, well, the regulation says I can put this on there. So that way they're at least able to utilize that inventory for something. Um, but that's kind of how that counseling piece goes for us. Awesome. So very, very uh disengaged it sounds like from what it was in the past and I, I can kind of see now it makes sense to where you say every service does it differently and that's why you know there's not an exact SOP for you know a pre-counseling and why we may get different questions on the industry side when people yeah. are moving that you would think would have been done in pre-counseling but so that makes a lot of sense and I think it helps the industry make sure that they go in depth and maybe talk about forms like the high value and what needs to go on them mm -hmm. um, we're seeing you know just kind of for for uh your side of view too is i, I just want to do a high value blurb here 
that if it's on the high value, the mover should be um, sealing that box. And it should be unsealed in front of you. Um, even if you don't, uh, if you waive unpacking, we at least got to go through the high value to make sure that everyone made it. Um, and there's a chain of custody process. So if we can get that out to, to the customers and the military members and the families out there, that would be a huge win to help complete that chain of command and make sure that important items are getting where they need to go. Or there's a quick balance of, well, this was recorded here, but wasn't recorded here. Now we know exactly where to go. So that's, that's all good feedback on the high value. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the last time that we walked into a physical transportation office to have anything done was um, when we were stationed at Fort Hood. So that was 2013. So about a decade ago, 10 years ago, was the last time that we physically were in a transportation office doing anything for our move. And that was when we were sitting in this giant room. It was like service members and their spouses. And we, we sat there and they walked us through box one, put in your full name, box two, put in your orders number. It's located here. Um, you know, since then we had very little contact with our transportation offices. Um, you know, we have our QA inspectors that come out, you know, when we're having our pack out and when we're having our delivery, but actually physically going to one and being counseled hasn't happened, at least on the Army side, in a while, unless you've had that first move or that separation move. Nice. Well, that's mm -hmm. very interesting feedback that I don't think a lot of people knew again. Um, so we've been pre-counseled and now we're coming out to load date. And one of the, you know, I think they changed the rule back in uh, last summer. It was that pre-existing property damage um, form that is to be filled out each day of service. Um, whether if it's a three-day pack, you're filling it out three days, um, and then your load date, obviously, and then a delivery date. And in there, um, there's seven days to report damage. Do you feel that that's a reasonable amount of time? Um, and let's separate the two. Let's talk about the load or the pack and the load, and then the delivery portion. Do we feel that seven days is maybe too much time for accidents to happen that can be claimed? Um, or maybe the member didn't notice that, you know, their son came through with a vacuum and blew a hole in the wall and, hey, it had to have been the movers. Is there, what's your feedback on that property damage form? Um, so as far as the, the pack out and load days, uh, the seven day, I mean, I think it's reasonable. I th I honestly think we could probably cut it down a little bit. Um, I know during pack out, there could be instances where, you know, something happens to the wall. And so your crews just start stacking boxes in front of that because they don't want to be the one to give bad news to anybody. Um, so you may not discover it until your stuff is out of your house. But again, once your stuff is out of your house, you should be walking through your home, verifying that everything got picked up, everything got loaded on the truck. And at that time, you should be able to see like, hey, there's this dent or scratch or hole on the wall that wasn't there previously. Um, as far as delivery, I think the seven days could probably be reasonable. I could probably even push to maybe asking for 10 days just because of the the speed at which somebody may be unpacking their home. Um, you know, a lot of times we have spouses unpacking a home by themselves because their service member arrives and goes to the field or goes TDY or on a rotation or we're moving before our service member and they are literally landing. Um, they're coming home from a rotation and they're literally landing on processing and then either driving or flying. Um, you know, so the spouse is taking care of a lot of things by themselves. So they might need a little extra time to unpack stuff. But again, you know, somebody damages a wall and they start stacking the boxes in front of that. And you don't know until you've unpacked the boxes and moved them and shifted them around to see, oh, there's damage here now. Um, you know, so I think on delivery day, I think seven days um, is reasonable. I, like I said, I could even argue we push to 10 just because of how long it may take somebody to unpack depending on the size of their shipment and if they're doing it themselves or not. I think on the pack loadout day, I think seven is definitely reasonable. I think that could even be cut down even shorter. Um, I know a lot of families, they their house gets emptied and they're going to a hotel and the next day they're, you know, hitting the road that you should know what your home looks like with the, the condition of your walls and your floors and all of that, you know, within a day of having everything out of your house. Yeah, no, and I think that you bring up a very valid point on the delivery side, and I think I agree with you on the origin side is, I, I mean, shoot, in, in my personal Chris Lance's opinion, I would give three days on the destination side and reduce it by three on the origin side. I think that would be a fair agreement because like you had said, you know, when our movers 
what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to do a final walkthrough. You know, it's, yeah. it's like kind of like when you buy a car and you walk around that car and you didn't, you know, see the scratch or whatever, or what, you know, didn't know it was there. Well, then how do you know it was there before it, you drove it off and took it to Jewel and then someone door dinged you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's final so I agree with you on that. I think that's, that's a valid point, especially at delivery. And that's why we try to get our crews as much as possible to, when we put boxes in a room, we like to put them in the middle with the inventory sticker facing out. Um, so it leaves that area around the walls for room and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it's, um, that's, that's pretty good. Um, so now we've, we've, we've packed and there's this big thing that was supposed to go into effect on May 15th. Luckily industry with, um, the tie in of GHC and different platforms and all of that stuff to use, we delayed the implementation of electronic inventories, at least until October or, or let's September, you know, whenever GHC comes through. What is your what is your consensus out there from the military spouses or you know active members? What is what are the how are they feeling about electronic inventories? Um, some people love it, some people hate it. Um, some people want to have a physical paper hard copy in their hands that they can go through and they can review line by line and tuck it in their PCS binder and take it with them and have it at their next location to check numbers off and to verify the contents written on it. Um, I've had done both ways. I've had a couple moves where we had electronic inventories and I'll say I love electronic inventories for the fact that I can read what is written there. I'm not trying to decipher somebody's handwriting to determine does it say table or tree? And does that tree mean my Christmas tree or does it mean like the coat tree I have hanging, uh, standing, you know, in our entryway? Uh, you know, so I love the fact that I'm able to read what is written there. Um, I love the fact I'm able to read the, the damage assessment codes that are written there. I'm not trying to determine is that a two or is that a seven, um, you know, for, for the damage of our table kind of thing. Um, so I love the electronic inventories for the easy readability of them. Um, I think some people, it's going to take a little bit to get used to that. I think the biggest thing that comes from our community in, in terms of electronic inventories um, is the lack of understanding of how they are to be used. Because we've seen times where there's been electronic inventory and then they're handing this iPad or this phone to the customer saying, here, sign this. And they're just like, well, I you can't go back and review it until you sign it. It doesn't let me go back. And so now this customer is signing something that they don't even know what it says. Um, you know, there's also concern that, you know, if after I sign it, can you go back and change things on there, uh, you know, before I get my copy emailed to me to make it look like you're covering yourself type of thing. Um, so there's a lot of concern and mistrust in the use of electric inventories. Um, there's also a lot of like for them as well, as I said, the readability of being able to see what's actually on there. Um, I like the idea that electronic inventories, especially for the furniture side of things, you can take a picture of the item and attach it to the line item. I think will go a long way, uh, you know, to be able to say, well, it's not, you know, scratched to pieces like all your damage codes say it is. Like there's one giant dent and it's cracked in half, which isn't listed in all your scratch codes, um, you know, to show the proper existing pre-existing condition of the item um so i like it for that reason but i think it's just going to take people time to get used to it uh, when we do move to it i think it's going to take time to get people to understand that you should be able to review it and add your customer notes in there before you sign it um and that it should be emailed to you immediately so that way you have it before um, you drive away. And I think in the rules, there, there was going to be language in there, like if it's not um, due to maybe like connectivity issues, if it's not emailed immediately, like they had so many days to get it to you, um, but it should not be, um, what's the word, altered after your signature as well. Yeah, no, and you bring up some valid points that I never even thought of with the authorization and stuff like that. Um, but luckily, I mean, if we're talking about this, I'm hoping someone in, in uh, you know, the electronic inventory fields are thinking about this or even tuned into the show in, in writing this down and taking notes of how to make their systems better, because that's very important. I, too, like yourself, I love the pictures as well, because on this side, you know, when we write uh, scratch and someone says it was a gouge, you know, we get charged back for that because we didn't put, you know, what's the difference between a gouge and a scratch? You know, it's 
it's so tedious and it's like well here's the picture does it look the yeah. same as it did then and it does now okay so we're talking about the same thing so hopefully that helps everybody out um and like you said with the chicken scratch writing they're trying to get it in they're trying to get it out um and even someone in the comments put uh i think it was destin um who said something about uh writing that everything is scratch smart even new furniture guys you don't gotta sign those inventories call your tsp immediately and let them know because that's an invalid inventory and it's and it's a problem so make sure your tsp <laughs> is alert for that um because we should not be doing that we need to do that's what we get paid to do is do a descriptive inventory with proper description. Otherwise, that's fraud. So, And you do have the right on those paper inventories to write that you do not agree with their um, assessment there before you sign it. You can even refuse to sign it um, yep. as well for it not being accurate. But it's important to note that your signature on it means it's your agreement that that inventory is accurate and the way that it is written. And it's also why I highly suggest to all of our families that before your movers come, go take pictures of your stuff as well. Take pictures of at least your furniture, um, you know, so that way you have your own copy of what that condition is like as well to help protect yourself. So that way we've seen that in, in some cases where the, the um, inventory has all those codes listed, where it's not accurate, not true, and the customer is able to provide a picture. Well, here's our table the day that it was being packed up. You can clearly see that it doesn't have this crack in it and that leg is not snapped in half and, um, right. you know, to kind of help protect yourself as well. Absolutely. All good feedback on the inventories. Coming soon, uh, those first 100 that are moving in September, they're going to be mandatory inventory. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I think, like you had said, we'll get better as we build this process. Um, let's roll into why are so many families, you're hearing a lot of chatter about this, and I don't know if it's because of the backlog or the delay, but why are so many families wanting to do PPMs? What makes moving yourself appealing and how does it work? Like. Walk me through the PPM process. Does the government hand you a check and say, here's 20,000, figure out your move? Or you know, what goes behind that? And I'd like to offer some insight to help the members that are doing PPMs after that on you know, how to choose your movers. Yeah, no. So a lot of people that do a PPMs, it's usually one of two reasons. One reason is because they had a very negative experience in the past using um, a moving company and they want to avoid having that same experience again. Um, the other reason comes because there is the possibility that you could potentially make a little bit of money in doing a PPM. So when we elect to do a PPM, um, and I'm going to talk about full PPM. So when we elect to do a full PPM, um, we set it up in DPS. We put in our estimated weight. So we are paid based off of the distance that we move and the actual weight that we move up to our authorized weight allowance. Um, it's generally rule of thumb that the more you move, the more you can kind of make maxing out your weight. Uh, you make a little bit more on that. Um, but Essentially, we, we see that our incentive pay could be $10,000. And so we figure out how do we want to move with $10,000. And sometimes we get people that want to hire a full service company because they just they want to control the move, but they don't want to do the work. So they'll go out and they'll search for a full service company to still come in and do everything. Some people will want um, to pack themselves because they're just like, if a plate breaks, I'd rather be mad at myself than someone else. So a lot of people will like to pack themselves. Um, we see a lot lately. The, the big thing is container companies, you know, you pack in Estes and pods where they come, they drop the, the pod or the trailer at your driveway and you load it up and they come and they haul it for you. You don't have to drive the giant Penske truck across country anymore. Um, you know, so a lot of people will elect to do it that way. And depending on where you're moving to and from and the size of the container that you need, you could potentially be able to pocket a little bit of money for that. Um, it's important to note for those watching about PPMs, it is an incentive pay, which is categorized as income, which means that it is taxed at 22%. Um, the way that we kind of get around that a little bit is that our operating costs, so like the cost for the pod, the cost for um, you know the boxes and the tape, we save those receipts and we submit them with our weight tickets and they lower the taxable amount of that incentive pay. So if our incentive pay is $10,000, but we have $5,000 in expenses, then only $5,000 will be taxed at the 22%. Um, so that kind of helps offset it a little bit with our what our expenses are. Um, but yeah, you're basically given, the, the military says this is 
based off your weight and your distance, this is what your incentive pay is. You figure out how to move your stuff. And if you pack something and break it, are you filing a claim against yourself, Megan? Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, with, with the container, come. I mean, obviously a full service company, if they come in and they pack for you, they'll have their own coverage stuff. Um, if you have a company, I mean, pods where you load it, um, generally there, there's some very, I haven't used pods or container companies, but I know um, from other friends, like they have some language in there that if the damage occurs because of something that is clearly from transit, uh, you know, like your pod shows up and the whole side is dented in, then like they're liable for it. You can file a claim against them. But if it shows up and like, you know, there was no vehicle accident, your pod is still in good shape or whatever, then anything broken inside is on you. Um, you know, they, they can't handle the fact that there was a giant pothole or whatever kind of thing. <laughs> or it got yeah. tossed around at the cross dock by a forklift driver. You know, all those things we've seen containerized shipments um but you know one thing that i want to kind of point out before we book our ppms because you're seeing an uptick in this and it's becoming a major problem is those brokers or rogue movers um we gotta you guys especially have to be do your due diligence um I, one thing that i would rely on as a very good source is talk to your state associations i'll name one just because it's the biggest one in the country um, California Movers and Storage Association, CMSA, you know, they know who the real movers are going online right now. They're doing a huge drive budget. You're, if you go on Facebook, if you go on uh, Instagram or LinkedIn, you're seeing budget ads pop up and talking about, Hey, we're real movers, this and that. Well, I actually did. I went through the process. Next thing you know, my phone was blowing up from 10, 15 movers. Then I would ask these people, so do you have a warehouse? Oh yeah, we have a warehouse. Where's it located? Well, I'm in Connecticut. Okay, well, where's your where where's your warehouse at? You say that you're in Florida. Well, I, I don't have access to it. Uh -uh, stop. Enough right there. You know, you, you have to do your due diligence because one thing too, another before I go on this rant, because this is killing real movers, it really gives us a bad name. Um, we get calls from association stuff. Hey, Chris, have you ever heard of this mover? No, and then I'd call and say, guys, that's not a real mover. That's a broker, and you got hosed because they they will never give you an answer of where your shipment is. And anyone that requests a down payment for a move is probably no good. Okay, that means that that's a little bit of a bait and switch to me because nine times out of ten, they're gonna they're gonna quote you. My own father it happened to him when I advised him against it. Um, he he went with a broker. He had to do a down payment. They loaded his stuff. Two weeks later, oh hey, your weight came back at this for delivery. We're gonna need an extra thousand. I'm like, see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. They're, they're not honest. They're they're scum of the industry, and you, we we got to make sure that you guys are getting the most professional services, even if you are doing a PPM, because you still deserve that. So, mm -hmm. just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's gonna be good. Um, you know that two thousand that you thought you pocketed, it, be careful because it may be coming out plus plus in the end when you know your shipment gets transferred around or it's three weeks late because in a ppm when there when there's a late shipment or when that mover and or pod doesn't show up i mean can is there still and this is a true question is there still an inconvenience claim process for you guys or is it does the military say hey you moved yourself this is on you so yeah so for that um it's when doing a PPM, the military is completely removed from the process. So we don't have all the protections that we have with the military. So that inconvenience claim is not part of it at all. Um, it's whatever the contract is that you sign with the company that's doing your move or with that container company that's doing your move. And if your pod shows up late, it you know you have to contact them and go by whatever um, that contract is that you signed. Uh, we do have a question here in the comments um, for you. Chris, I'm going to put it up here from Sarah. Can you repeat what you said about the associations again um, in finding a PPM company? Absolutely. <laughs> the one I used in specific is the California um, Moving and Storage Association, CMSA. But every state has their own moving association. Look it up. Find it. They are a great resource to guiding you to real movers, not leeches, not people that are going to defraud you and stuff like that. That's, that's very important because we see it go on, especially in the summertime. These are when these people's eyes open and just want to get in there and take advantage of our service members. 
Yeah. And we've got a great episode coming next week where we're going to talk specifically about PPMs, the rogue criminal companies, um, things to know about how to have a successful PPM. So make sure you put that on your calendar for next week as well. And we got comments here in the com um, from Christine here in the comments about how uh, last summer they had a lot of, I'll, I'll toss it up here on the screen. They had a lot of some uh, shady actions uh, with pack rats last summer, which is another one of the big container companies that we see recommended in our groups as well. Um, that there was a lot of unanswered questions and inability to tell them where their things were and extra charges and that uh, for them, it just felt um, really shady. So one of the things we always suggest if you do a PPM, get a couple of quotes, um, you know, three to four, uh, it should give you a roundabout idea of what it is going to cost to move your stuff from A to B. Um, if one seems really high, it may not exactly be the best. If one seems extremely low, it's probably a little shady as well. But if you've got a couple that are, you know, within maybe a couple hundred dollars of each other, they're probably a more legit company that you want to look at and maybe go with. But and again, join us next week. We're going to go into detail about all of the PPM stuff. Yeah, And don't rely solely on the FMCSA website, please. There's loopholes. We've seen some. Um, if you've been in my group, you know, I always recommend that that site um, and everything. But we've seen a couple of times where families have gone to that site to look through for a moving company and have found some issues with the ones that they have found there. Uh, you know, so you always got to do some checking, do some looking. Um, if you are in my PCS group, I went down the rabbit hole, same as Chris, a uh, couple a week ago or so um, about it and found uh, I have a good post in there explaining some things about rogue movers and criminal companies and one that I found that when I put in my information it said we are finding you the best deal you know of, like different moving companies and I'm just like oh you're a broker like oh that that's a no and then like the confirmation email I got was like very very vague um, and no good warm and fuzzies there so be sure to check that out too absolutely all good points and um destin had another question in the comments real quick and then we'll, we'll roll on um but this is very yeah. important um yes destin your state associations even uh kevin brought up that there are multi-state associations like southwest movers associations those are all good that can do intra which is inside the state or inter which is state to state so they will definitely provide you with good moving contacts I mean, in real companies that you can then dig into even further, you know, go on their Google. Um, I'd stay away from Yelp. We've learned that Yelp is bought. Um, the more you pay, the higher your scores are. But Google hasn't gotten there yet. So that's a pretty reliable source. Um, and then also like Nextdoor app is a great um, check. If you type in the mover's name there, you may see articles on them. Um, so, yeah, definitely hit up your associations. Stay away from the brokers. Stay away from the rogue movers um they're, they're everywhere and they come out in the summer when they know that you guys need them most um so you ready to move on yeah let's go let's rock and roll all right um let's talk about does the military community oh, i gotta use the three the 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 um the alpha does the military community know about ghc and what is their knowledge of what's to come that's supposedly starting right now in in September of 2023. Yeah, so I think um, it's going to be hit or miss as to what people know and don't know about the GHC. So the GHC, the Global Household Goods Contract, um, people that might have been PCSing over the last couple of years might have seen little blurbs of it in the news here and there, but you know it was started and then stopped and then started and then stopped as protests happened. Um, I don't think a lot of people really understand what it is and what it's going to mean to the program until we are fully in it and we are actually having people move under it. I think only then once we get closer to probably August, September, are people really going to take wow. note as to what the GHC is, what the program is, what it means. Um, I've been trying to give some heads up to folks in my group that if you're moving September or later, you could potentially be moving under this program. Um, you know, so if you get told, you know, set your move up on this site versus that site, you may, you know, it's a legit thing. Um, you may be moving under the GHC, you're uh, you know, but your neighbor may be moving under our current program. So we're going to have a period of time where we have two different systems going on. Um, but I think a lot of people aren't going to pay attention to it and aren't really going to know what it is and the details of it until we are about to launch and officially in there. 
and you bring up good points because if it should hopefully for members sake and everybody's sake be pretty seamless um it's movers moving um really it's the distribution of it that really changed um so i'm hoping that you're right and hoping that members they, they don't know the difference between tops dps or ghc um mm -hmm. they just say hey i'm moving and i had a good move hopefully so hopefully that's you know what's to come here in september um you know we're excited uh to you know it's it, there's excitement there's there's a lot of emotions going on about it but i think you're right we don't know until it gets here what it's going to be and let's let's not cut it short but before you know let's not rally against it when we there are a lot of unknowns still and they just did a road show i think they have a one in vegas still that they haven't mm -hmm. done and i mean if members want to go to that i'm sure it's open to them too to understand and learn about you know what's to come in the military program um you know that we'll, we'll all be seeing here shortly um after summer yeah no definitely um, um and as we get closer to it more information from transcom and the services will be pushed out about it um it's the concept to me briefs well i'm always concerned about the execution piece of it but again we'll see that soon and shortly and see how that that happens yeah no we're all excited and um, mm -hmm. um it'll be interesting to do a show you know maybe three months in or first quarter of next year to kind of see how the transition was and see if we're still speaking the same on it but i think it will be exciting and i think it will be pretty good for all um yes yes we'll you. have chris back next january so he can give us his insights as to nice. the first few months of ghc and how it's impacted him and what he's seen i'm in sign me up um i'm gonna roll into another uh Destin, you may want to uh, tune into this one too. Um, lithium batteries, what are members' knowledge and concerns on them not being included in shipments if that does get published and it's over a certain wattage um, and goes on the no pack list like household good chemicals? Um, yeah. What kind of impact is that going to have? I just bought my robo vacuum um, for 600 bucks. Now I have to move. Let's let's talk about Oconus first. Now I'm moving to Japan. Can I bring it? What, what What's going on with lithium in the industry right now? Um, a lot of things are happening. Um, so those who don't know, especially from a military community, um, starting May 15th, there is going to be uh, some strict regulations on lithium batteries in our shipments. If you have a non-temp storage shipment, they will not be allowed at all. Um, if you are have a household goods shipment of any kind, it's going to be limited into the size of batteries you can have in your shipment. And so those sizes are, um, it's, I don't have it right in front of me. So it's 20 watt hours or 100 watt hours, and it depends on whether it's chargeable or non-rechargeable as to which one of those it falls under. But when we look at basic things that are in our home, so like my daughter has a hoverboard. A hoverboard is at, um, what did I say earlier? 154 watt hours. A robot vacuum, depending on which one you have, is 60 to 110 watt hours. Um, a drill battery is around 72 hours, and an e-bike is 300 to 1,000 watt hours, depending on which one you have. So if you're going Oconus, these things, depending on the size may not be allowed in your shipment, which means they can't be shipped and they're going to be left behind. And you're going to have to figure out either storing them yourself, sending them to a family member's house to hold on to till you return, or ultimately probably selling them. And I imagine there's probably going to be a hot resale market um, happening in our spouse groups for the lithium battery products. Uh, we've seen over the last several months, there's been an uptick in the number of fires and shipments that have come from lithium batteries combusting. So that's the concern and that's why they're making this regulation to kind of tighten on the size of batteries that are being shipped but when we look at our everyday household items that we have i mean it's going to be um, a good number of things that may not be able to ship in our household goods and i i get it we have first world problems of how do we get our robot vacuum to japan um, i know there are companies that will ship um lithium battery products, they got to be packaged a certain way, they got to be labeled a certain way. Um, but countries have regulations too. So going to Japan, you can only ship a lithium battery product if it's brand new in box. So your seven year old robot vacuum won't be able to go. So I, I see I, I've already seen it in, in my group, a lot of pushback on it, um, especially our families that are already Oconus, like they moved this stuff here two years ago, we're moving the summer, like they should be able to move it back. Um, I see a lot of people have said, you know, well, we've always shipped lithium battery products and we've moved to some very hot places in the middle of the summer and never had a problem. And 
I get that, but you don't want the next time to be the one-off crazy chance that that product suddenly combusts because of the lithium battery. Um, But I think it's going to take some time and some some work together between our our communities as to what contains lithium batteries, what can and cannot go. Um, It's going to take some understanding from my community as to the reasons why lithium batteries are being um, restricted in their size and shipments um, and what contains lithium batteries and understanding like we can't because I've seen this in my group already where people are just like, well, I hope they're ready to you know pay that claim when I claim my e-bike that they won't ship. It's going to be on a do not pack list like our other batteries and our cleaning chemicals and our opened oils and opened alcohol and other stuff. So, I mean, it's not that they don't want to ship it. It's a liability reason that they cannot ship it. And it's it's going to take some understanding from my community to, to get that and to see the reasons why, um, you know, going Oconus, it's, I think it's going to be a very hard hard pill to swallow in a way as to how do I get my stuff there or, you know, do I invest in this or do I wait or do I try to get something used on a resale market? Um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a learning lesson in there. That it is. And, and may I, everyone stay tuned because I think we had said that they mm-hmm. haven't really finalized the rules regulations on that yet. Um, so keep your ears to the ground because like I said, you know, and, and please don't try to, to hide them in the shipment or anything like that, um, that will put a good mover out of business because unfortunately mm-hmm. they will be the ones liable for that uh, because they didn't, you know, they they didn't seek it out and remove it. Um, so we want to make sure that everyone's being honest because this is going to be an uptick and it's and it's going to hurt and it's going to hurt the pocket too um, mm-hmm. because you know I've always wanted one of those Robo vacuums, um, but I, I just I couldn't I couldn't fathom spending five hundred bucks on them. So I use my old dust, my old dust pan and broom still like a good old housewife that I am. Um, Listen, let me just tell you, let me sell you on it right now, Chris, because we had one. It recently died. It was really old. So I'm due to get another one. Um, But I loved it, especially with having little kids and pets, because I set ours to go. You can program them to go off at whatever time. And so ours would always go off at like one in the morning when we're all sleeping. And I would wake up to like freshly vacuumed floors. So like anybody that randomly shows up at my door in the morning to like drop something off, like my house looked put together because at least my floors were clean and they got cleaned while we all slept. Like it was amazing. Uh, It's definitely worth it. But I mean, um, here in the comments, we got Sarah mentioning, you know, you can fly with some in your carry-ons. You know, I think airlines have restrictions on on sizes and and types as well. So, you know, definitely check if you're flying Oconus, if it's a battery you can remove, like maybe your drill batteries or something um, or your hoverboard that you can put into a carry on, Um, you know, check to see if uh, those can fly with you. And then Dustin, a couple of comments um, here about how, you know, understanding the reasoning, but, you know, again, how do you these items got moved to Germany where she's at, you know, so how do you get them back to the States? So we know one of those things like, well, you moved it here. You need to move it back. And, uh, you know, how, the, the work around around that, you know, I don't think um, it's going to be a very easy thing to do. Yeah. And it might cost more than the product itself to ship it. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. all great comments on lithium batteries. Stay tuned. That's going to be a hot topic. No pun intended. Um, but last thoughts on, what the industry and what what we should know. Um, Megan, I'll start with you first. How can we work together to be better all around, especially with peak season upon us? We know that that's the most craziest time of the year for moves to be happening, especially in the DOD world. How can we Mm -hmm. do this together to make it less of an impact in a negative way um, within the next couple months coming up here? I think a lot of um, a lot of that can just be some good understanding between our communities as to what goes into a PCS and what goes into planning it Um, and planning it from both sides, because a lot of it, I mean, we see what happens on our side and trying to find a house and plan what our dates are and pre-pack and what goes in our car and how are we getting there, but also understanding, you know, from the industry side, like the planning that goes into our move from y'all side and understanding also that, you know, life happens. And so why our, our shipment might've been scheduled for five, 
folks to come pack our homes. Somebody's car broke down. Somebody got sick. Somebody's wife went into labor early. And now suddenly our five man crew is now down to a two or three man crew. And now we may need an extra day to pack because some people weren't able to show up the first day. And just having that understanding that life happens, um, you know, and also for us, I mean, again, life happens. We had uh, the last time we were at Leavenworth, we had the stomach virus through our house 48 hours before we were scheduled to pack out. And so here I was thinking like, goodness, I'm going to have like my family quarantined in a room while they pack everything else. Like, you know, do, do I do that? Do we push through it to get it done? Do I need to call them and start asking to reschedule dates because, you know, like I can't have kids throwing up in the bathroom while I have people packing stuff, you know? Um, and so I think a lot of that being able to work together is having understanding that life happens from both sides, um, trying to have that flexibility from both sides because life can happen. Um, and then just understanding for us that we have to go through this every two to three years. It's not exactly something that we ask to do. You know, we fell in love with our service member and we gladly, pick up and move around to support them and the career that they chose to defend our country. And so like, yes, we move a lot, but we also want to have, you know, pride in our home. And so some of us don't go buy all the, the cheap furniture from Walmart. We buy the, we invest in the good solid wood stuff and the nice things. And so sometimes we get comments from, from crews, well, you move a lot. You should have the cheap stuff that going to break. Like you shouldn't buy the nice stuff until you are done moving. And so some, sometimes those comments hurt because we live such a nomadic lifestyle that we put our, our roots are into our household goods are into those things that mean something to us are the co one constant we have in our life. They're the things our kids see in the house we're leaving from. And they're going to be the things they see in the house when we arrive. And so when something doesn't show up or it shows up broken or damaged, it can mean a lot to a family. Um, and so I think just having that understanding of, you know, like, yes, I can go buy a new table, but it's not going to be the same table where the memories were made when all of my friends came over for Thanksgiving, when, when our husbands were all deployed, um, you know, we all just the Thanksgiving together. It's not the same table where, you know, when we couldn't travel home for Christmas and we had all the single soldiers in the barracks that didn't have the funds or a home to go to for Christmas, we had them over for Christmas dinner. So they had some place to be. And so, yes, I can buy a new table, but it's not the same table. It's not the table that has all those memories. And so I think it's just being able to understand and have some of that empathy for our community. No, and, that, and that's a great, that's a great, uh, that's great feedback. And Sandra hit it on the head. And those things create quote unquote homes wherever you are. Um, and then uh, did you give Destin our, our, our prescript to this? Because the next point we're going to talk about is communication. Um, you're right, Destin, this is a big issue with the community and the industry side. Um, and it's a common issue. And it, it all starts and ends with proper communication. Um, and I want to let you guys know as the military community, um, with what they've done in the restructure of the BBS 2.0, unfortunately, the way that they're scoring this now, if you choose to move, I, I want to give you a heads up because I want you guys to be diligent and diligent in this process. Um, if you need to move your dates outside of that seven day window that the military gives you, go to the PIPSO first because mm -hmm. TSPs now have their high hands uh, handcuffed behind their back and won't do it because th that provides them a zero score in that box or a bad score. Um, this program has gone, kind of shifted to a data-driven, uh, you know, customer service than it has to actual service on the curb. And another plug here that I think we need to do is the reason for that is because when you when the when the government shows a four to seven percent survey return from the military group, that's a problem. So they had to go somewhere else now to get this data. When a lot of times, you know. I just had a request yesterday. Someone wanted to, you know, when you bring it up to Transcom, it's like, well, not many people shift their dates. What do you, you know, I just had a request yesterday of someone that wants to push it back a month. That's well out of the seven days. And if that PIPSO doesn't do a change order, that TSP is going to get dinged and it's going to affect your future business. So please go directly to your PIPSOs. If there's a date change outside of those seven days and work both because the PIPSO isn't going to allow it or change the date in VPS. If they hear from you, even emails weren't working to a point. 
So please be vigilant in that so we can make sure that we service your moves whenever you need them serviced. But communication, that all, it all comes down to communication. Commun communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, you know, when you're going to go into SIT or if you're going direct, you know, those are all good things to know previously um, before the truck, you know, the, before the rubber starts turning on the road so we can start that plan and process because there might be a family on board that wants it direct ASAP. And, you know, you may want it a couple of days. Maybe I shift my route a little bit because you're both going to the same area to accommodate both of you. That could happen. But unless we know about it, it's, it's too hard to read minds in this industry and or in life in general. So please, you know, just talk about it. Um, and another thing, you know, I kind of want to talk about uh, to wrap this call up. And we, since we got four minutes, um, this was a great call, by the way. Great job. Uh, is there's 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 some I don't want to use the word bad apples, but I don't really know another term to use. But there's bad apples on both sides of the ball. Um, if we can come together mm -hmm. and kind of weed out those bad apples, I think we're not only going to bring quality up in this whole program, regardless if it's DPS, TOPS, GHC, whatever the next acronym they're going to use after that. Um, if we can if we can come together, we'll bring quality up and we're going to start seeing more capacity come into this. Um, I think the community as a whole has a un, un, an untrue gnome over military moves, you know, high claims, high demanding, you know, stuff that you don't see on the COD side. And that's all, in my opinion, that's all crap. You know, these are, these are people that are, are no different than national account or COD. It's just nine times or 10 times out of 10, it's full service move. You're getting the packing on every job and stuff like that. So if we can help police each other, you know, I mean, you've come to me a couple of times in regards to some miscommunication on TSP sides or, you know, even the PIPs will come and, hey, I need a top dog over here because I need answers. You know, we work together to get that to you because we know import how important it is for you guys, military members, DOD personnel to schedule their life pretty much. Mm -hmm. And when something's two or three weeks late and they're not hearing anything, that's a problem. And we need to get a solution to that. You know, before we start the ranting in the rave, let's get a solution. Um, so, you know, and, and on your side too, on, on the DOD side, come together. If you know, if you hear someone's filing erroneous claims, try to talk them out of it. Tell them that claims kill moving companies. Mm -hmm. You know, and, yeah. and it, it's, we want to be here to support you guys, but we also, you know, we need to come together and build this team ship and bring it back. And I think, We've gone a long way, especially with your platform. You know, we, you've kind of started bringing the movers in, and you know, we've we've if IEM has you on their shows and stuff like that. We're building a good synergy here. Let's not let anything ruin this and start allowing it to tap into quality and allowing more capacity so we can move you guys throughout the summer a lot easier than you know, crate and freights no touch loads and all that stuff. I mean, that's our creative way to get capacity moved because we have no drivers that, you know, there's there's drivers allocated to other business. I want to make the military the prime business. Yeah, no, absolutely. So many great things in there. Um, if you're in my group, you guys hear me say a lot to not play the system, to not game the system is not worth it. Moving is not a, re is not a good reason for jail. Um, it's not a good reason to lose your career over. Uh, there's a lot more things that make better stories and saying, I lost my career because I frauded the government on a moving claim. Um, there's a lot better reasons to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, you know, but it's definitely not worth it. We can only improve this process when we have all the stakeholders together and we're able to help educate each other and we're able to help, you know, find those issues and then work together for the solutions to make this process better. And so when we can all be able to say, hey, like this is the right thing to do or this is not the right thing to do. It goes a long way to to helping that. And the communication piece is definitely huge because I know there's many times where things shift on our side of the deal. Um, you know, if you the moment something in your move changes, whether it's your weight, suddenly you're not getting rid of that that living room set and now you want to keep it, you should let your move coordinator know so that way they know to you know the living room set that you said during your survey wasn't going to move is now suddenly moving that takes up extra space on the truck um 
you know, let them know that suddenly maybe you said, oh, everything is going. And now you decided, well, we'll just buy new bedroom sets when we move because these ones are old. Let your move coordinator know because now that truck may have the ability to pick up another small load to help somebody out. Uh, the moment you, you know, your housing situation changes, maybe you get your keys early and they can accommodate an earlier delivery or maybe a direct delivery because, you know, your stuff is still in transit. You know, it can go a long way to help shifting around some things to make things easier for someone else. I'll say our la last summer when we moved here, we had a, a possible ability where we were maybe not going to be, we knew we were getting our keys on July 1st. Um, it was a Friday and we kept trying to communicate with our landlord. And uh, at first they were saying, you know, like 4 p.m. on Friday. And I'm like, that's not going to work. Like my truck is coming on Friday. I need my keys earlier because we're not unloading until nine o'clock at night and definitely not doing it with flashlights, you know, after that, um, you know. And so the second like I knew there was going to be a possibility like that we weren't getting our keys till Friday evening, I started communicating with our driver. Um, I had his contact info and I was like, Chris, like his name was Chris too. Chris is a great name, y'all. Um, well, look at you, probably too. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Chris, I'm like, hey, heads up, like is a Saturday delivery like out of the question? Like this is what the situation I'm looking at right now. He's like, I can do a Saturday delivery. He's like, but I may not have the crew because it's harder to get crews on a weekend. And I was like, I will see what I can do. I will let you know as soon as I know something. Uh, thankfully, through other means, we were able to get the keys to our house Thursday afternoon. And so once I had the keys in my hand, I like snapped a picture and I sent it to him. I'm like, I have the key. Like, we're good for tomorrow. And he's like, I will be there at 8 a.m. I'm like, okay, I'll have coffee going for you. Because um, that moved with that. My, my, my instant, uh, not instant pot, my air fryer, my coffee maker move with us because those are things we need in our house. Um, this is, I was like, I'll have coffee going and things worked out great. But it was the moment, you know, we knew that there could be a potential issue, letting them know so that way they can start working things on their end as well. Um, you know, because that communication is key and just being able for us to work together. And you hit it on the head real quick. I know that we're <laughs> running over time a little bit, but you hit it on the head because these drivers have to set up labor especially yeah. in the summertime you know when when you set up labor for a friday and then they get canceled on a thursday you know that impacts the driver and a lot of times and i don't know if you're on any of the boards but a lot of times that labor is looking for a kick still even i mean even though they could probably have another job like that but they're hey, i need 50 to 100 bucks uh, because i took my time out of the schedule to have you scheduled so, I mean, there is a financial implication to that as well. So being upfront and honest and coordinating in communication, if you do that, I mean, I think you're you're a lot, you're farther ahead than others, um, which is a positive. And it's going to be a positive yeah. move experience for you. Yeah, no, definitely. So um, we covered a lot of good things today. We're going to have Chris back on our show. Maybe later this summer, once we get into peak season, we can do an update as to what's happening, what we're seeing. <laughs> it might be a little grayer or <laughs> a little bit less, um, you know, but I think we're going to, we're going to have you back on later. So I'd love to hear your perspective. Once we get into peak season, what's happening on the ground, how things are going, um, issues that are popping up that maybe we all need to know about so we can all plan and prepare for and try to mitigate. Um, but Chris, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm glad that I uh, raised my hand to do this when, when you put it out there, I felt like this was my time to shine. I think I'm going to Hollywood next. So, you know, this was a great stepping stone for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. And everybody else watching, thank you so much for taking time out of your day as well to join us. I hope whether you are military community, thank you all for chiming in with some of the uh, questions and answers as well. If you're the moving industry, I hope you all learned something to kind of help you in this upcoming season, help give some insight to things. Make sure to join us next week. As I said, we're going to have some more industry movers on as well next week, and we're going to go into Great detail. Panel. Yes. Um, really excited, but we're going to go into detail about PPMs, what you need to know in regards to finding a company, how to protect yourself, the different methods that you can do it, all of that good information. So mark that on your calendar um, Tuesday, same time, same place. Um, Before we sign off real quick. Yes. Did we beat Dan Bradley's podcast episode? Right, we just have to um, go. 
Uh, maybe. I don't know. I, I go okay. back and I look 24 hours later right, uh, cool. what the numbers are. So I will let you know Sounds tomorrow okay. um, exactly what uh, <laughs> our moving industry, they are competitive folks trying to beat each other here. Um, we love a good competition, though. It's Got great. But thank you all for joining us. And remember, if you are in the middle of your PCS planning that you got questions, issues, concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out. We are always happy to help you with whatever it is or to guide you to the regulation or the office that you may need to talk with them. Uh, join us next week. And until then, take care of each other.